Hey everyone, Christian Montes here, and this is First Contact Stories of the Call Center, brought to you by Noble Biz, your one-stop shop for all your telco and carrier needs. Don't forget to click on that subscribe button on Apple Podcasts and Spotify, and check out our YouTube channel for special clips. Each show, we talk to industry leaders and how they get their start in the call center industry. Because let's be honest, it's not a dream job. My guest today is Krista Heibel, a major influencer in the contact center industry and founder of CH Consulting Group and Replenish Yoga and Wellness. She's worked nearly every single job in the industry from telemarketer to CEO. Her unconventional creative approach to problem solving creates very effective solutions for her clients. Krista, welcome to the show. Thanks for joining. Thank you, Christian. Excited to be here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I bet. We've been laughing so much. I wish everyone was seeing what was happening before this. But uh, hey, look, the pre-show got us going. And uh, the point of the show is to really understand, you know, what gets people in the industry. So I really have to know. And I think everybody else wants to know, how did you end up in the call center industry? needed money in college. So going to private university and uh, paying for part of that myself meant a lot of part-time jobs. And one day there was a flyer on my car in the university parking lot for a telefundraiser. So okay. I got my start at a national nonprofit and then eventually political fundraising firm. And I started on the phones with like four of my roommates at the time. Everybody needed rent and beer money. Very important. I'm sure the the necessities are required in college. And if it gets you through, then, you know, that's where you get it. So, um, you know, that's interesting. You say that's always looking at how people get their start into the contact center world. And, uh, and it sounds like you started off early, right? That was just one of the things that got you in. And so... You know, when you think about all the things early on and even now, what is probably one thing about you that you would say surprises people? Something about me that surprises people. I Probably for those that knew me for the first two thirds of my life, it's the yoga side. So I am uh, I have been in business since the day I took that job at that first contact center operation. And I've been primarily through most of my career in and around the contact center business development sales space. And I think I have always been very entrepreneurial and very driven. And um, I think that the yoga side, which is a little bit newer, is a surprise for those that know my business driven side. Got it. Well, I'll tell you, we'll definitely want to cover mindfulness and, you know, how that <laughs> has played a role in your life and how we got there. And so um, definitely when it comes to my side of it, when I think of it, yeah, you're right. I, I, first thing I hear of is uh, when someone says yoga, I go, like, OK, uh, is that just part of exercise for you or is there some mm -hmm. sort of routine or part of your life? But I guess since we went there, you might as well just go for it. I, I think I really need to understand. It, you said it's more recent. So what got you into yoga? Um, I'd say maybe 10. It's been about 11 years now since I did my teacher training certification. Oh, I've wow, been okay. practicing just as a way of uh, physical activity. I was never really athletic or a runner. I swam when I was uh, competitively when I was in high school. Um but I wasn't, I'm not a, I'm not a big athlete. So yoga was a good way for me to physically stay active. And I think it was honestly during one of those periods in my life when I was trying to think about what I wanted to be when I grew up, uh, which happens like every three years to me and usually <laughs> is <laughs> around like, how do I get out of this crazy contact center space? And I decided- And yoga brings you back in? <laughs> well, it did in a really in a really crazy way because uh, I thought if I could do anything, I would teach yoga on a beach somewhere, right? That will be my backup career. And uh, the journey crazy. through the teacher training course and since then really just grounded me more in my entrepreneur business self. So um, I think it's made me a better leader and it's made me a better partner. 
and it's made me a better planner. Uh, so yeah, it's kind of funny how it brought me all the way back since it started as something I thought might be an escape. <laughs> Got it. Well, it sounds like instead of it becoming an alternative to your life, it reinforced how to be uh, more in the moment and successful in your life. And it sounds like um, from the the key term everyone's using, mindfulness or being in the moment, um, would you say there's anything in particular that this has allowed you to do in the work life? And also, has it helped you enable separating personal and work life? Mm. Well, I think I think you'll hear me mantra often that leadership matters. So when we as CH Consulting Group go into organizations to help them solve problems and 60 to 65% of our new engagements are helping organizations evaluate where they're at and, and how to improve or grow or scale um, into a better future state. And so when, when we go into those scenarios, we oftentimes end up back into the CEO's office who hired us saying, oh, you wanted to know why that problem exists? You know, we root cause it right back into him <laughs> or her, right? And so it's the mantra that leadership matters and how we show up as leaders has a huge impact on where our organization and our team are going to be capable of going. So through the practice of yoga, which includes meditation, which we now call mindfulness here, it's really about being present. It's about being in the moment so that we can hear our teams, we can really sit and be present in group discussions, in meetings, and that makes a big difference for outcomes and decision making and staff development. So I think, uh, you know, that's how it's made me a better leader. And I think it's why now I kind of consider myself this weird little Western yogi that wants to like, you know, make all of my CEO clients do meditation. Like I threaten that frequently with clients. <laughs> I have Got converted it. some, I will not lie. <laughs> okay. Well, two for one on that one. So you're, mm -hmm. you're able to convert more business mm -hmm. and convert more, more into yoga. So mm -hmm. when you start looking at the implementation of mindfulness or being in the moment, both from a leadership perspective, as you say, it starts at the top, it obviously manifests its way down throughout the rest of the organization. But do you see on the interactions that most align with the touch points of where your customer interacts with their customer, right? Where agents are interacting with people or even people that are working with the systems that create a journey for people. Is mindfulness being in the moment or things that you can learn from yoga translate into those areas of uh, where you can improve? Or is this mostly from a leadership perspective on being able to at least just be present in those moments uh, with your staff? No, I think, Christian, it's exactly as you know it is, which is why you rattled off all those <laughs> other scenarios, right? I mean, when when an agent is present and really listening to a consumer or a customer, that's going to yield a better customer experience. And that is one of the most used phrases in the business world today. The consumer's are demanding a quality experience wherever they are looking to have an interaction with the business. And so if I'm not listening as an agent, I mean, in 1993, we called it active listening, right? And we train that skill. Now we're going to call it mindfulness and being present. Same concept. Being a good communicator requires us to be present, right? So, and you mentioned like technology. I mean, accuracy of follow-up and notes and data. The contact center is an extremely data-driven, quantifiable component of a business. But accuracy is critical. So, you know, we want agents and we want managers and staff to be present and mindful in what they're doing. So we have good quality information to analyze and improve both the internal work culture for employees, but also that in turn creates a better customer experience. So it all is holistic. We talk about how everything within the contact center is holistic. Talk. It all matters, right? 
Absolutely. And I think when we talk about wellness and being able to have uh, some sense of uh, reducing a friction points, right? There's everything from your interaction with your, um, your coworkers, your technology, with the way that you interact with customers, the way you interact with leadership and their message and the mission of the business. And anytime you can leverage, whether it be mindfulness and being in the moment to actually listen before you're just mm -hmm. ready to read that to being able to start looking at things from the perspective of, hey, um, this is just a transaction. It's not an interaction. It's yes. literally black and white. Let me just get through it versus be in it with it, right? You know, you can hear people say, you know, are you uh, interacting uh, in that moment with somebody or at that person, right? Because if it's at that, that person, it's about you and getting what you want out of that transaction. Is there something industry wise, if there was one thing that you could change that you would want? See? Well, I mean, I, I if there was one thing industry wide, I could change. I, I have a lot of different soap boxes I stand on periodically, Christian. So every, every three years, <laughs> but I, you know, I, I think it's about how we take care of each other as a team. Right. So there's all this research today that now quantifies that the better the employee experience, the better the internal culture, the better the training, the support, the leadership, all of those things are are really critical to how the employee feels and that translates into directly what the customer experiences. And I think that that is super important. It's something I feel like I've been saying for 25 years since I started on the phones and I still remember what that is like and then moved my way into supervising and training and other positions, I always felt like the better I supported and developed the people under me, the better and easier my life would be and the, the better the whole business or team or division or center would run. But unfortunately, this industry doesn't always have a reputation for valuing the human resource element, which really is our product. So, you know, if there's one thing that I could change, it would be how we work as a team. And I'm very well known for telling my executive clients that the most important people are not in the boardroom. They're out on the floor. And that's what we need to remember. Well, that's a great segue because as you had mentioned, as you've worked over time in different roles, those roles had to have built on not only the experience you got, but the insight that each of these individual roles experience on a daily basis. And so when you're out there being able to give insight into things that could improve, whether that be from mindfulness and mindset to best practice to technology, I'm sure you have uh, positions that were your least favorite and ones that mm -hmm. you probably enjoyed more than the others. So just to indulge everybody, what would have been those roles? The ones that were just definitely the worst you'd ever had to the ones that are just, hey, this was the best thing since sliced bread. Well, the only position in the whole like operational contact center structure I never did directly was workforce management. So I've obviously in VP, director, COO, CEO roles been responsible for workforce management, but I was never actually on the workforce management team. Um, and I think that was probably for a reason. <laughs> um, but I think one of my favorite is supervisor. I, I'm just still a, I am a big proponent of frontline supervisor staff. You know, they are excited. It's usually been a promotion and an opportunity to really change somebody's life and develop their skills. And it's where the rubber meets the road in, in any customer experience or contact center operation. And I loved managing and developing a team. And uh, so I think that's still one of my favorite. Uh, and I think what is one of my... I mean, I think one of the hardest jobs is the CEO, right? Because you you have to know where your blind spots are. You, you need to know what your strengths and your weaknesses are. 
uh, and you need to surround yourself with people that compliment. And if you have a blind spot in your rear view mirror about yourself and about what you are, or you are not good at that, that is going to hinder you in the entire organization. So I'm an entrepreneur. Don't get me wrong. I love owning, starting and managing businesses, but um, it's not all glory at the top. Got it. Well, you know, it's interesting that that would be the response and only from the perspective that I think mm -hmm. a lot of people have not run or owned a business um, mm -hmm. and been in a position which they have to make those difficult decisions or they have mm -hmm. to really be uh, looking into themselves and realizing what things will uh, be allowing them to surround themselves with people that are better than they are in things that they're not necessarily the right person for, right? Being able to delegate, being able to have other people that can run things, uh, I think is uh, something that not everybody has, right? There's people that uh, don't want to give up control. They want to do it their way. Um, and then there are others that realize that they're not the best person for that thing. And if they really want the business to exponentially get to where they want to go and when they want to get there, if not sooner, they really have to put all the right pieces in the right place. And if you look at any game and any um, even chess, as an example, all the pieces aren't the same. And it's not just one piece playing. It's a combination of all the pieces in the right places at the right time. So uh, hopefully that um, gives everyone some insight into all the roles you've had, which ones are obviously the drivers. So one of the things that I think, again, we've talked about forever, uh, but I'd love to get your experience on it and your insight is, you know, the term omni-channel. Obviously, mm. we've talked about multi-channel. We've talked about uh, channel neutral. We've talked about omni-channel, uh, variations of communicating. But when when you hear omni-channel in the business, right, when you're talking to customers, what does it mean to you? And does it always align with what your customers think it is? Hmm. That's great. I I didn't know you were going to ask me this. And this is one of my favorite topics because we love to gravitate to buzzwords in this industry <laughs> and, and talk about things in theory long before I see them actually in practicality within our client's deployment, right? Mm -hmm. So omni-channel to us, we define omni-channel as a fully integrated multi-communication channel approach to service support and sales. So for us, that is supporting whatever appropriate communication channels need to be in place based on our customers, consumer or customer, our customers, customer base. And so that could include traditional voice and IVR, web chat, social media response management, self-service options, mobile app options, um, we consider multi-channel to be when many of those channels are being offered, but not fully integrated. So if you're running and supporting email and web chat and voice, but they're on three completely different systems mm -hmm. without the consolidating, consolidated reporting and analytics on the back end, we would call you multi-channel. And if you are in a fully integrated uh, cross-channel data available customer tracking and analytics scenario, we would call that omni-channel. And uh, I, you know, for us, this is a consumer-driven requirement. It is not optional uh, because of cell phones and internet and technology today, the consumer is dictating how and when they want to communicate with you. And there is a plethora of research out there that supports if you do not provide the appropriate channel with the appropriate response rates and time, you are very likely losing business. So uh, we try to help our clients get to that full appropriate omni-channel state as is appropriate for their business today. Do you see that the communication via multiple channels being driven when you say by the consumer, right? The customer is demanding this. Do you see it in one sector or industry or even one 
group of individuals that may be driving this more than others? Or do you see it across the board where regardless of industry, regardless of the, the department you're working with, or even the person you're talking with, they're, they're still demanding to be able to do beyond just voice? Uh, it is it is across all verticals today. It may vary by business type what channels of communication are most appropriate for you to open up, but it is not an option to not be multi-channeled or omni in some format today. And we work with small startup and like you know two hundred employee organizations all the way up to large global enterprise organizations with you know, 50,000, 100,000 employees. So there is a broad variance of adoption amongst our clients and partners, but it is not optional to be looking at Omni and creating some sort of a strategy to get there. It, it might start with a multi-channel approach and again, what channels you're deploying are not the same for every business. I think when people started talking about omni-channel, everybody went through web chat on their website, right? Half of them yep. didn't turn it on or didn't know how to respond to it. But they're like, look at us. We have web chat now, right? And so that's not appropriate or required for every business type. So figuring out how your customers want to communicate with you is, is very specific by vertical and, and by business, in our opinion. And then clearly, we do a lot of work in healthcare and financial services. So data privacy and HIPAA, you know, also impact how some businesses can use different channels of communication as well. Well, I'm glad you brought all that up because I think when people talk about omni-channel at a high level, it's like, yeah, I turn it on. I just turn omni-channel on. I install mm -hmm. omni-channel. And many times when people are first doing it, uh, agents could be doing multiple channels at once and they have to train differently. They have to learn whether or not they separate groups for just certain types of channels. Then there's other situations where uh, in that one interaction, you have access to multiple channels. So maybe I send you an SMS message with a code to confirm who you are on your mobile phone. Then maybe I'm able to send you a follow up email and then maybe even a reminder where I'm able to be able to convert you from a, a web chat into a phone call, in the same interaction without losing the data or without having to send you somewhere else. So depending on how you want to approach this, I can imagine that everything from the training, the technology limitations and what they're trying to accomplish have to come into play. You don't just turn it on. And so that's an area I'm sure that you focus on. So do you have any uh, insight or feedback you'd give to someone that says, hey, I just want omni channel. Um, it's not just turning it on and off, right? No, no. And it and it's everything you listed and more, right? It's it's how you evaluate not only, as I mentioned, what channels are really appropriate for the organization to just turn on, but then it's also the resources and staffing. If I had a dollar for every time I said, just because I'm a good voice agent doesn't mean I'm a good web chat agent, I would be retiring. So there's that. <laughs> Right. There's making sure that skill sets are appropriate from one channel to another on the human resource side. Uh, and then the other huge opportunity we see in helping organizations beyond the technology deployment and integration is in the KPI or key performance indicator and reporting and analytics of those channels. Right. So just like from a traditional voice perspective, we have KPIs that we want to be monitoring around the activity of an agent or a group or the division or the contact center. And we have standards and averages that we expect from a performance perspective that holds true in every other channel of communication. And so really helping organizations figure that out, like what is the appropriate number of chats that an agent can be simultaneously doing, right? We deployed web chat and everybody got excited five, six years ago. I don't know. I've been doing this a long time. And we said, oh, 
they can do multiple chats at a time. And, you know, we were pushing agents to like do four web chats and saying, oh my God, it's so much cheaper than voice because we can do four to one. But the mm -hmm. quality of that was a problem. Now on average, we're back down to maybe two chats at a time in most industries, right? So there's figuring those kind of performance management matrix and the reporting to manage those other channels as well as we do voice. Yeah, and I think as you start to augment those channels and enhance them with um, artificial intelligence, bots, uh, automation, being able to provide more real-time insight into a transaction to uh, enable the agent to do more faster, better, or mm. to create a better self-service environment, which that obviously has a completely different cost model. Uh, but in those scenarios, you can clearly see that um, even if the technology enables you to do more interactions, there's still going to be um, moments in which technology will meet the person in a way in which you want to make things faster, better, um, and you're able to do more with less, right? But at the same time, um, I can imagine that even though that agent may be able to do two interactions properly today, that with enough technology and other items, uh, there's that question of at what point uh, is there a cusp where less agents are needed or will you need agents for all this stuff? And there's that debate that, uh, yeah, you're going to absolutely still need that point where humans are going to want to talk to humans. You're going to have to have uh, certain types of agents. Do you have any feedback or thought on that? I, I have I have uh, about 80 pages of thought on that. We just participated in a research project around artificial intelligence in service. And uh, this is all coming out in April. So I, I can't go into too deep of a dive into this. But I will tell you the consumer response to this research very clearly states that artificial intelligence has a role, but it is not anywhere near replacing the human touch. So I was part of a technology conference in September last year in New York, and uh, AI was a really big part of the agenda. And, and you know, almost every speaker and all of us panelists were there talking about that. And yet this weird thing happened at the end of the day, this room of like 75 people kind of broke into this like big group discussion. And after a day of talking about technology, we were talking about agents mm -hmm. and, and the importance of the human piece of all of this still, which I thought was really fascinating. So the research we just did in Q1 absolutely backs that up. You know, easy, simple transactions where automation can improve the speed with accuracy and ease to the consumer, the consumer will take that all day long. But if yeah, there is a big <laughs> problem, right, if there's a big problem and it's something that's important to you, your money, your health, you want an agent and they will not accept technology that gets you stuck in a loop with technology versus being able at any point in time to say zero out, I want to talk to a live agent. So um, we can get really excited. I, we as a consulting firm focus on return on investment and make financial business cases for our recommendations to our clients on technology investment all day long. So we understand the value that technology brings from an efficiency perspective and fully support that. But that does not always equate to better customer experience. So that is a fine line. I think we are all still trying to figure out together. Yeah, no, I totally agree because there's times where you dread having to call into a company because you've interacted with them before and you know how difficult it is not only to get through all the menus and options and confirmation of things. And I know for security reasons, they require you to put all this information. But sometimes in that moment, I don't have that long code available to me and I won't memorize it to be able to type it in while looking at it at the same time. One of the worst experiences I've had as a consumer with my cell phone carrier, who shall go nameless at this time, was when I had to set up international calling. 
So I'm old school. I want to hear somebody say to me, yes, Krista, India, Malaysia, and Singapore are now all active on your phone. So I called the 800 number. And when I routed myself through the IVR to wanting to activate international calling, they sent me a text and said, do it here. Here is a digital way. And they hung up on me on the phone. So I oh, played nice. their game. Yes, it was lovely customer experience. I played their game and I went into the, the chat, right, to activate it. And I went through the series of what countries are you going to, what dates are you leaving? And at the very end, I said, okay, can you confirm I'm set up? No response. Hello? No response. So I called the 800 number back wanting to hear <laughs> my phone was set up for India, Malaysia, and Singapore, and they sent me the chat bot again. Of course, because they and had a history of your journey, and they yeah. knew that you called back again, and they knew it was in a certain period of time, and they knew where to send you, uh, and that your issue was resolved, and so on and so forth. Of course, yeah, very intuitive. They knew exactly your pain points and the friction that you were yeah. having with their business. But yeah. I think that's a great segue into something you just mentioned, customer experience, right? So um, when we talk about customer service and versus customer experience, how do you find those two things being different or the same? Um, obviously, I want to give you the opportunity to say, yeah, they are the same or no, they're different. Well, so there's overlap. Uh, I think we view customer service as a subset of the customer experience. So when we define customer experience today, we start all the way in the very beginning of the first impressions of the brand or the product or the company through the life cycle of that prospect to customer. So customer experience to us includes all of those touch points and marketing points where the consumer sees the brand, the messaging, and then moves through the sales process and into a support and service role. And so that whole umbrella of all the ways that the consumer sees or the business touches the consumer to us is the whole of customer experience. Customer service is that phase of customer experience post-sale where we are taking care of the relationship and the needs of, of an existing customer. So that, that's kind of how we define the two. It, within the umbrella of customer experience today, it really brings the front end marketing and, and branding element of a business together with the contact center the sales, service, and support elements of the business. And that encompasses the whole of the experience. And, you know, one other just, you said what, you know, how has that evolved or some of the differences? You know, in, in 1998, we decided as the business what kind of customer service we would provide. We decided as an industry, you know, to set service levels at, 80% answered in 30 seconds. You know, we defined all of that. Today, the consumer will tell you how long they're going to wait on hold and how fast they want that, that web chat responded to and how quickly you better get on their Facebook page and defend yourself, right? So, so the power has shifted uh, from us dictating what service levels should look like to the consumer dictating what the whole experience should be. Do you think that shift is actually improving the experience? Uh, I think it's a journey. I, 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 think, I, I think that by way of giving the consumer more options to communicate how they want, I think we're on the right path there. Um, is everybody doing it well? Um, probably, you know, no. And some of it goes back to the AI and other automation and where we've forced that rather than integrated it as a helpful tool. So I think, I think we're still figuring it out. I, I would say overall it's better. Yeah. I, I, I think that some of the, the, the implementation of technologies when they're new, uh, there's the idea that this is going to change the world, right? 
oh, you can talk mm -hmm. to the IVR and you can just say, hey, tell me what you, why you're called today. And someone sits there and goes, well, it's going to take me a paragraph to explain why I called. And I don't know where you're going to send me. Oh, look, a bird. <laughs> I had a brilliant point, Christian. And it was about how old I am and how long I've been doing this. And it just floated right out of my head. So case in point. <laughs> Well, look, uh, all I can say is this, is it was so epic. I'm so sorry everybody missed that. Tune in next time to be able to get to what you remembered uh, in yeah. episode two. Uh, so look, it, it, I'm sure it'll come back to you and we'll have a great insert for that. Uh, but meanwhile, let's kind of shift right to the topic at hand. Everyone's talking about it. It's impacting everybody, regardless of what's going on in, in, in the world and where you're doing, what your job is. There's not a person that doesn't have an impact to them around the coronavirus. Mm. So in the contact center world specifically, there's the requirement for some to be able to work remote, right? And in some situations, some companies are having challenges in those areas. And separate from that, there's the reality that uh, technology may not be great remote. Uh, you may have your whole family and kids at home with you. So it's a very challenging time for a lot of companies, but right now are probably scrambling because it's the first time they've probably ever put a plan in play. Um, what have you been able to see and analyze and what companies have started to act on or not throughout this time? What have they started to act on? Yeah, have Did they? Have, yeah, have they done anything in particular mm -hmm. that you're seeing as a trend around um, how they're responding to this? Yeah. So obviously everybody's at home now, right? Globally, uh, I, I don't, I'm unaware of a market today that I have a client in that isn't in some sort of a stay where you are scenario or go home and work scenario. So uh, everybody has been scrambling to set that up and get into that work at home mode. Clearly those that already have gone into like cloud technology and already had outside access set up for some element of, of work at home prior to this uh, made that transition smoother than others. Uh, and so we have, you know, prospects and clients and partners within the gamut of that. Um, I think everybody now is seeing some uh, bandwidth issues and some internet connectivity quality issues since we've all gone home to work. Uh, that's at, even more exasperated and a bigger challenge for some of our international clients. Mm -hmm. So for the most part, uh, I think you know, things feel a little strained here in the U.S. I've been trying to log into conference calls in the last week and a half and, you know, getting fast, busy signals and having to dial in multiple times to get through. And my connectivity feels a little up and down. Uh, but, you know, for clients that we have in the Philippines and in India, you know, a lot of their staff, they don't even have connectivity at home. Mm -hmm. So there's been a lot of scrambling and a lot of creativity that has been going into trying to manage this entire situation globally. Uh, we have some business partners, that, uh, one business partner that literally rented an entire hotel out uh, in the Philippines so that they could literally put their employees and family in quarantine there and could keep them working and, and online. We know other large BPOs in the Philippines that have uh, actually put housing in to their corporate office. So that's a market where they've had in some of the larger cities limited mobility allowed. Um, and again, dealing with some of the connectivity challenges at, for the work at home is is a, a whole new thing. And when you get outside of the technology of transitioning to work at home, not everybody does it well, right? So mm -hmm. sometimes your top producers go home and it's not a great fit anymore. And if you don't have a team seasoned in managing remotely, this is becoming a challenge. So getting everybody plugged in kind of feels like it was step one in the last week and a half. Now it's making sure that the wheels stay on, on track and, and they're not all just working at, they're, they're not just home plugged in, but they're working effectively. Right. So, uh, lot, lots, of lots of new challenges. So I, I think this will, sorry, yeah, I, I think this will create a, 
larger work at home map permanently within the contact center space now. Uh, now that people have had to go through the process of of technology wise setting that up, um, I think we'll see a larger work at home pool in this market, even when all of this is done. And that kind of excites us because a lot of research says that really opens up a different quality of agent. Mm -hmm. um, and and so I think it's going to have a long term lasting impact on business. Yeah, I think when you when you start engaging a different person that not only performs better remotely, but access to people, it's really you're limited by whether or not they can get connected, right? Mm -hmm. uh, because at that point, you're not just living it within the centers of where you actually have a pool of people to pick from, you're able to pull different people from different parts of the country and the world. Uh, but separate from that, you also are able to look at and you had mentioned someone who's maybe good at voice, may not be good at web chat, but you may not have to have someone that does web chat in the office. Um, and you may not have to have them for voice or vice versa. So uh, I think you're right that it's going to be interesting seeing what things people are doing right now to deal with everything that's going on and what is going to stay and become part of the process going forward. So yeah, I think so there's that human element again, right of now adjusting to remote performance management and just remote staff development and management process adjustment in general. The other thing I would actually mention takes you and I full circle in this conversation. But we also think it also has to do with omni channel. So for organizations that have been slower to adopt to an omni-channel approach, like being able now to open up web chat or look at how they do that more effectively um, and or social media response management um, or self-service options for sure right now. If, if we have a lot of organizations we see that just haven't invested in what we think are adequate self-service options. So this is now also a time to revisit your Omni strategy and where you really are at in that and make sure that that's prioritized appropriately for short term and long term and just automation in general, right? So there are some sectors and there are some businesses that despite this global chaos are doing okay right now, but we have other clients and, and uh, vertical markets where revenue is all but almost completely disappeared for them. And so there is going to be a significant impact on budgets for a lot of businesses. And so looking at again and dusting off and making sure you have the right IT strategy in place and you're using automation, AI, bots, right? Things that will create greater efficiency uh, may end up being really important to a lot of PLs before this year is over. Yeah, I bet. And I think, you know, anyone who's ever displaced and replaced their technology platform. They know it's disruptive to the business. They know that there uh, are challenges. It's never perfect. And it does take time, effort, and resources. And obviously right now, all of those are things people don't really have, right? They don't have very much time. They have limited resources, both financially with revenue streams and cash flow drying up, uh, but also being able to say that they weren't prepared for this. So would you say that someone finding a stopgap right now that's not perfect, but it allows for some business continuity is more important than truly just saying it's time to just move our whole system into a cloud solution or a solution that allows omni capable uh, interactions, or is it truly on a case by case basis, which one better suits their needs? I think it's a case by case basis. I, I mean, we are definitely seeing uh, organizations that have not had a previous work at home program um, are, are scrambling into that a little bit. And again, they're just like getting people home and online and trying to figure that out. And, and there's kind of more of a phased approach. Uh, some of them are not even trying to do or be everything that they were three weeks ago in the office. They're just trying to maintain kind of a minimal level uh, of support, you know, and hoping that this really short term, uh, 
self-quarantine phase ends in a reasonable amount of time. Uh, but, but there are others that are taking the opportunity to deploy new things and they're doing it and moving swiftly and aggressively. So, so much of that depends on, uh, financial situation of the organization. Again, not all are being, you know, uh, hurt at this point, right? I mean, Zoom is an example of a company whose <laughs> stock is going up and yeah. usage is going up. And I, I think they're having some support challenges and issues right now. But, you know, so so there are deployments and implementations happening where the financial and the IT resources or subject matter expert resources are available to make that happen. So we've talked a lot about how technology will help enable, or right now, lack of the technology is not enabling companies to migrate to uh, remote work to the way they were, or at least as a bridge gap, we've talked about how KPIs and performance management has to be reviewed. Uh, but when it comes to the person, remember if we circle back even to the beginning of, of people, right? The most important asset you have. And in the end, you, even in your research, you still need good people in the interactions that require them because uh, technology and self-service alone isn't enough. So there's a lot of people that are stressed right now, people that are dealing with a lot of challenges outside of just having to work remote. Um, would you say that companies right now should be doing something in particular to help or to be there or to facilitate things for their employees? Not only just that they can log into a system and take a call or to do a web chat, uh, but that's helping those interactions not suffer from poor experience, right? Poor customer service, because in that moment, if you have a lot of people that are upset, they're depressed, they're sad, they don't want to work. So everybody is stressed, right? The agent and the consumer. So this is a two-way street and this goes back to humans being kind, right? So to your first part of that, should companies be thinking about ways to take care of their employees Yes, we should always be thinking about ways to take care of our employees. We should always be sensitive to the, the agent experience, right? The agent experience, like we discussed in the beginning of this, directly creates the customer experience. And right now, both the customer and the agent are worried and they're stressed. Good news for a lot of us in this industry, we're still working, Agents have been sent home, right? Not not in all not in all situations, but there is still work happening, mm -hmm. and so. But there are, there's a huge sector of our population that's worried about paying rent, right? That that are not able with businesses like bars and restaurants and salons and things being closed. You know, we they're worried about how bills are going to be paid in May. And so this is all going into every interaction, right? The customer and the agent in this stress time. Yeah. And so I, I know I've had uh, both a fantastic experience as a consumer in the last week with an agent, with an organization that I work with. I called in as, as a customer to let them know there was a problem with my order. And it was very clear to me that this agent, based primarily on the quality of the, the actual connection, <laughs> was working at home. And she shared very honestly, she had just recently been transitioned to a work at home situation. And she was amazing. She was so amazing, but she was struggling. She was struggling around the technology, um, and and you know she did a great job. I had a not so fantastic experience with a airlines that I am super super committed to, <laughs> and it was my first ever agent complaint I ever filed with them, and I I. Uh, I thought I was exceedingly patient, but I could tell she was very stressed. And I'm sure the quantity and volume of calls that they're taking has has put them under tremendous stress, right? So um, we just have to be human in all of this. As business leaders, we need to take care of our people. No more or less than we should be every day, but you know, we, but with a different focus. Um, and we need to be patient as in our uh customer service industry to those calling in and know they're also scared and worried. Uh, and then the consumer should also be grateful when they dial 1-800, whatever, that somebody's still answering that phone, right? And they're to take care of them. We just need to be kind. 
I think you couldn't have said it better. And I think that in this moment, all the things that we do together allows for when things get back to quote unquote, whatever normal is, there's going to be some things that we've learned from this, some things that we've been able to take with us mm -hmm. and be able to improve in the future. And so being able to do all that and through all that knowledge you've had, you've obviously done that through your business CH consulting group. Uh, so I'd love to just kind of spend the last little bit of time we have together is kind of diving into that a little bit. How did that come about? When did that come about? And you know, what is it specifically that you do as the business? Yeah. So I think after trying to leave the contact center industry five or six times in my career and realizing I was never going away, right? It didn't matter what I went to do. If you're in business, the phone is a key component of communication and communication is a key component of business. So um, one thing I learned about myself, Christian, at a very uh, early stage in all of this is that I'm a change agent. I, I am attracted to the challenging moments. I am great when something needs to start up, turn around, be fixed, grow aggressively, deploy change, implement change. That is my thing. And whenever it would be done, and everything would be running smoothly. And I was very competitive. So my teams and my contact centers and my businesses always eventually got to running very smoothly. I would then be very bored. And so I used to say I'm a bad employee. <laughs> I'm good in the moment. In all the stress moments nobody else wants, I shine. But when everything is smooth, I'm a bad employee. So consulting is a perfect fit for me. Right. I love to come in and help assess and map out how to improve it and, and be accountable and responsible for doing that. So that's really what CH Consulting Group does today. We go into organizations and we help them identify areas that are opportunities to do better, whether it's take better care of their staff or their customer or have a better IT strategy or manage operational processes and workflow better. We help identify those scale, grow faster, better, uh, improve P&L, improve performance. We help figure that out. And I think one of the things that makes us unique um, by way of consultants is we don't just slap up a PowerPoint and say, go do this. We are oftentimes invited in and accountable for getting it done. So I like to say we'll sit in the boardroom with the PowerPoint and talk about strategy with the executive team all day long. But where we shine is still out on that floor training supervisors who, if you remember, are my favorite people, right? <laughs> So we'll get in and tactically redo and retrain the trainers. We'll come in and train the agents up on skills and train the supervisors up on skills. Um, we are both tactical and able to be strategic. And I think that that's a big deal to us. It makes us feel like we've actually earned our keep and uh, we bring return on investment in what we do to our clients. And, and we're all really weird and have been doing this a long time and love it. So I have the best team in the world. I think combined, there's over 300 years of contact center leadership in this group. So, well, that's awesome. And, you know, I, I really appreciate that insight because obviously a lot of companies, they usually stick within to be able to make decisions. And sometimes they don't engage the outside or they do and they don't always implement it. So being able mm -hmm. to allow someone from the outside looking in um, and thinking that you're not always the expert in everything. And if you were, then you'd be doing exponential growth regularly and everything would be running smoothly and uh, mm -hmm. all the things would be working properly. So that's that's great to hear. And so Krista, uh, thank you so much for joining us today, especially during these uh, very difficult times, but where can people find you? On social media, web? Yeah, I'm all over. So we are chconsultinggroup.com website. Uh, you can find Krista Heibel and CH Consulting Group on LinkedIn and Facebook. Uh, we do do a uh, e-newsletter that uh, has a lot of really good trends and educational information in it that you can sign up for on the website. And we'd love to have you follow us. And I'm always available if anybody needs help. Awesome. Well, thanks so much, Krista. It's great having you here.
Thank you, Christian. It was a pleasure. Have a great day. <laughs> yeah, you too. See, I can't stop laughing. I'm sorry. <laughs> All right. So serious space now. No, I can't do it. All right.